Welcome to The Selling Show, where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. My next guest... If my BMW GPS could have the voice of my choice, it would be Mr. Ronnie Lieber. Ronnie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, David. Um, It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to join you on your show. So tell us a little bit about the Ronnie Lieber empire, what it is, how it works, what you do. Tell us about the backstory of how you came to be doing the work that you're doing today. (laughs) <laughs> well, I've never heard about the Ronnie Lieber empire, but if you want to name it like that, well, I would say my empire is all about wowing your audience, like really to create an emotional connection, to create a special atmosphere, to take your client, your customer, whoever it is that you're dealing with on a journey, to so take them from where they are at and then take them to where you want them to go and adding value along the way. I would say that's my journey in a nutshell. And what that means, what I've done is in the past, um, well, almost 15 years, I've hosted events with, uh, I got to entertain more than 5 million people live. When COVID hit, I transitioned to TV. I've been now more than a thousand hours live on TV. Before all of that, I was doing sales, like door-to-door sales 20 years ago. I was knocking doors. I was at 3,000 people's homes. And it was an incredible school and incredible teaching and, and learnings that I've brought with me up to this day. I love what you're saying about the emotional journey and then adding value along the way. I think a lot of people, a lot of speakers, trainers, coaches, and consultants, they think that a virtual event is a training event first or a learning event first and make them feel good and make them happy sort of along the way, have a sense of bonding, have a sense of community. I have come to learn, and I'd love to tap your wisdom on this. I just recently literally came to learn. It is 180 degrees opposite. It is all about the emotional connection. It is all about the emotional journey. And then as you said, the learning, the training, the content, that is secondary. Because if someone is not in the right mindset to receive, and they're not in the right mindset to transform, you could have the world's greatest content. It's going to bounce off their forehead like a foam rubber ball. Talk to us about what are some of the, when you do MC work, when you host events, when you help your clients host events, how do you map out that emotional journey? And then how do you start to implement some of those things to invite the audience to take this emotional journey with you? I would love to do that. And I also want to tap into what you just said. Because uh, actually it reminds me of just a little story that I had with a client of mine that I was coaching. And he was um, basically a teacher. He was coaching other people. And he told me that like, hey, I don't know. Like, I know this guy needs this. And I tried to give it to him, but then he doesn't want it. I said, look, the secret is you need to give them what they want or to sell them what they want and give them what they need. So basically, you need to wrap it in a package of what they actually want. Or like, for example, nobody's buying, let's say, um, abdominal exercises. People are buying a six-pack. They want to have a six-pack. They don't want to have abdominal exercises or they don't want to have like, oh, yeah, great. Now I need to just eat the green stuff and so on. No, no, no. They actually, you need to sell them what they want and then also give them what they need. That's very, very important. And talking about that emotional journey, all of us in a way are about, I mean, we are feeling creatures, like we all have emotions and all of us are being touched by emotions. And when we meet somebody, it's all about this emotional creation or or that emotional bridge that I have to somebody. Like, for example, when you meet somebody within the first tenths of a second, you create a judgment. You create like, do I trust this person? Is this somebody that I want to be with, like that I want to have as my guide? Is this somebody that I at least trust for the next however long you want to spend time with that person? And the job that you need to do first 
when you are the person that wants to be trusted, you need to know who is your audience. You need to know who is the person that you're actually talking to. That means you need to understand what are their needs, their desires, their wants. Who is it? Where do they come from? Like, where do they come from before they actually meet with you? Where are they at? And then you need to also understand when they meet you, what is their emotional involvement? Is this something that is important for them? Is it something that means something to them? For example, let's say you are in, in financial services and you sell to people. Um, and, and for example, one guy sells car insurances and the other guy sells a life insurance. Yeah, basically both sell insurances. But what you're selling, when you're selling a car insurance, usually you need to have a car insurance. Like it's mandatory, at least uh, in some parts of the world. And it's not like, wow, today I'm getting a car insurance. It's going to be amazing. Said no one ever. Yeah. So it's more going to be like, but when you are selling a life insurance or you are selling, for example, you're financing a new home, it's totally different because people are coming to you with a dream. They have an emotional involvement. If you know that, you need to know that person that comes to you, what is their emotional involvement? In other terms, because I also, I've done a lot of stadium work with tens of thousands of people in a sports context. And I need to understand the people that are coming into the stadium today. Why are they here? And also, who is the opponent? Is this a special rivalry? Is this something where people are like, ah, oh, man, we lost very often against them. But today is the day. Today is the day when we are finally going to beat them. I, I feel it in my guts. And even though most of the times you lose, it doesn't matter because today is the day. And then, you know, this is what they're feeling. You know, the pain that they've gone through and you know that they are just looking for a way to be set free, to unleash, to be like, today is the day. If you know that, then you can grab their pain. You can grab them where they're at and then you can take them on a journey and you can bring them to freedom. You can bring them to where they want to go. But you need to know the journey. You need to see the journey before they see it. And you need to know who is, is who is your ideal client? Who is that person that's coming? And then you take him on a journey to where you want them to go. Yeah, really, really profound. Let me ask you that because this is so critically important. You absolutely need to know who they are, why they're there, what are their struggles, what are their pains, what are their battle scars? right? Where have they come from where they've been beat up? They've been bruised. They've been disappointed. They've been let down. So let's say we're doing a virtual event and people come in, they sit down, they turn on zoom and they're just expecting a data dump. They're expecting a webinar. They're expecting information. How do you, in the first few minutes of a virtual event, open them up and say, you know, you don't say this, but the strategy is you think you came here for content, but you're really, I'm going to take you down a road of transformation. What are some of the initial things that you think about? What are some of the initial exercises even? Like the first five, 10 or 15 minutes of a virtual event, it could either go down the path of this is going to be a three-day webinar or, oh my God, I'm so glad I signed up for this. This is like unlike any other event I've ever attended. What do you do? When you're hosting an event or emceeing an event or advising a client, how do you open up that first initial experience of an event to give them that wow factor that you are famous for? David, it's a great question. First of all, when does the experience start? Because the experience, many people believe like, oh, great. The experience starts once a person clicks the link to get into a Zoom room. It does not. Because the experience starts the moment that this person first gets into contact with you. And also when you want him to be part of your virtual event, did you even frame it as an event? Did you frame it as a meeting, as a webinar? And if you framed it as an event, does it actually deserve the title event? What is an event? Is it something that also has some entertainment elements? Is it something that really is supposed to feel like an event or like a live event? Or is it just, oh, yeah, now I named it event. But just the name event doesn't make it an event. So what does it mean? And, and I actually want to give an example. 
I was hosting a virtual event for a big um, global company that everybody knows who produces cameras. And I was hosting their New Year's kickoff event virtually. That was back in 2021. I remember the first thing that I, when we, when we started to, because they were very new in that field and they were, they also like hired me for consulting and they always said a kickoff meeting. I said, look, if you want to have this as an event, the first thing you need to change is your wording. You cannot tell them this is going to be a kickoff meeting. It's going to be a kickoff event because that's the first thing you need to pre-frame that you need to like plant a seed that this is going to be an event. Then one of the things that you oftentimes have at a, at a live event, at least if it's a multi-day event, for example, and also those have gone virtual, is you have a registration up front. So you get material, maybe you get it like a material box or something. Like usually when you go there, you get something, maybe you sent this up front. Like, hey, this is your stuff, like your onboarding process or part of the onboarding process. Then you have the registration. And with registration, you actually have like you have somebody who welcomes you in Zoom at the registration just to check that everything is going right, that there is a tech check, that everything works fine. And that especially makes sense, of course, if you have a longer day event. And then also when you get into the event, is it just like one person sitting in front of a screen and, and talking to a camera? Or is, it, is there a stage? Is there music playing? Is there maybe some dancing going on? Are there screens around? Are there, like, is there some kind of production? behind it. Something where people are like, oh, wow, this is cool. And that's a big thing. Do the people see other participants? Like, do you see other people in there? Or do you just see the person? Or do you just see the content? Like, is it a two-way communication that you feel there are more people than just me? Or is it like watching TV or maybe a webinar where I do have a chat function and I just put in some stuff? But the moment you actually, that, that, that it starts to develop this dynamic of having a back and forth conversation of not just using the chat as an instrument, and the chat is a very critical instrument, but also of having that feedback of seeing them, of, of actually feeling them, of having them participate. If you have some music, if you have some people get out of your chair and, and uh, get out of the chairs and like really moving their body, because especially when it comes to a longer event, like, let's say that this is going to be several hours or it's going to be several days and several hours a day, then you really, really, really need to manage their state. And that is critical. If you do not manage their state, they're going to zone out. You're going to lose them. If you just make this a, a story about what's going on in their mind and some rational stuff and like no emotions involved, you're going to lose them. It's, the value is going to be gone because people are going to be falling asleep. And no, and, and, or doing something else, but you really need to capture them. You need to involve them. You need to guide them through the journey and also see when are they getting tired? When do they need some activation? When do they need somebody like that, that really gets them on their feet that, that maybe that they move and so on. Like you're not going to have the same instruments or tools that you have when you have them live in front of you, but you do have some tools and you need to think about that. You need to also have this in your mind as you're going through the event. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Holy smoke, so much value in this episode. Listen, if you are loving what you're hearing, feel free to download, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to The Selling Show. Now, back to the interview. Now, there are different kinds of people, right? There are people who love to dance. There's people who don't want to dance. There's people who want to get up out of their chair and boogie. There's people who want to take the deep yogic breath with you, the deep yoga breath, and then exhale. People who are willing to play along. And then there are people who are like either reluctant to play along or like, wait a minute, I've never done this on a Zoom call. This feels weird to me. How do you win over in a virtual environment? Are there some strategies to win over the people that might be a little bit more shy or a little bit less demonstrative, a little bit less willing to play with you without making them feel excluded or weird. Absolutely. And thank you for addressing that. First of all, what is really critical is the way that you frame it, the way that you present it to them. It's really critical that you do not make it about you. Like, hey, you need to do this because of me. Like, you need to do this because... No, you need to make it about them. 
What is the value that they are getting when they are doing that? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And why does this make sense? What happens if they do not do it? And it's what you give is what you get. And being here is about playing full out. And everything that we do has a reason. And you also explain them the reason. You explain them the science behind it. You explain them why it is what it is. And then you can get them moving or you can basically build it up. Yeah, that's great. Ronnie, tell me about Zoom fatigue. Do you believe in Zoom fatigue? Is there such a thing in Zoom fatigue? Or is there just bad Zoom fatigue? How do you think about it? Well, uh, that's a great question, David. It's always Zoom fatigue compared to what? Because if it's like Zoom fatigue compared to like meeting people in person, and I believe that there are some people that prefer several things to be in person, but for others, they prefer Zoom. Or is it just Zoom fatigue in terms of like, man, I just want to do something else. And I believe that especially when it comes to virtual events, it's really, really, really critical. Does the person feel like he is part of an event? Because that's the big thing. I remember the first time, and that was in March 2020, just uh, like basically when COVID hit, or was it maybe April or something like that? Yeah. March, April, May. And I was part of an event as a participant. Three-day event over Zoom. And I thought, well, it was supposed to be live, but let's see how it is. And that was the first time that I felt, hey, that's really cool. Like, I feel like I'm part of an event. I feel like this is a real event. And this is really cool. And what's great about it compared to an in-person event, at an in-person event, it always depends on where you're sitting in a room. Like if you're sitting up front close to a stage, it's like, oh, you feel the energy and it's like, oh, great, there's a speaker and, and, and you're totally in it. And maybe you're sitting like somewhere in the back of the room and it's not the same. Like maybe even it's not as loud or like you, or it's just like a tiny dot on a screen or on a stage or however big it is. And you, you feel a drop of an energy at some events. The great thing about a virtual event everybody's going to have the same experience. Everybody really sees that person right in front of them. And that's a huge advantage. It's also something that you, as somebody who's presenting, as somebody who is doing the event, that you can take advantage of, that you need to know this is really, really awesome. And what's really cool about it, if you master the selling from stage, you can absolutely increase and multiply what you have been selling live compared to what you're selling online just because of that closer intimate connection yeah amazing i'm curious ronnie because there are you know you can come into an event and let's say it's a three-day event like big heavy duty event and i know you've done these events you know 10 hours a day three days morning noon night and all kinds of things are happening there's sort of a build-up process that you can't, you know, day one, hour one, minute one, you're not going to get any audience member to open up their deepest, darkest secrets or mindset blocks or personal tragedies. How do you know the emotional arc of an event? Or is there a recipe or a formula that you like to share with your clients for that emotional arc of the event? When is it okay to go deep? When is it okay to bring them back? When is it okay to go deep again? Is there a cadence or is there a recommended flow that you've seen be particularly effective? Uh, that's a great question, David. And, and actually, um, there is a saying in German, which is my native language, and it's like the way that you yell it into the woods, it's going to come out again. Yeah. And so if you want somebody else to open up, you need to open up first. What does it mean? Also, you need to be vulnerable. You need to show your vulnerable side. You need to show that you're not perfect. Because to be honest, none of us are. Yeah. And if you are just being superficial on stage, you cannot expect a deep emotional reaction. That's the very first thing. Also, how do you plan? How do you actually take them on the ride? You know, the point is, it does not matter how long your talk or your event is. There's always the same system behind it. There's always the same system behind it. The first thing you got to plan, what is your outcome? What is the outcome? What is the outcome of the event? And it doesn't matter if it's a three-day event, if it's a five-day event, if it's an hour speech, 
what is the outcome of your time there? And if you have, for example, a three-day event or a two-day event, you have the overall outcome at the end of the event. This is what you want them to take with. And then you create outcomes for every day, for example. And then you can break it down, outcomes for the processes and so on. So first thing is, what is your outcome? The next point is, where is your starting point? And that actually also ties back with who is your audience and where do they come from? What are their um, pre-experiences? What do they already know about you? Are you part of a bigger event or are you the whole event? Is this your event or is it somebody else's event? Or you're just there to speak for an hour or something? And who comes before you? Who comes after you? Where do you fit in the program? Why are the people here? Are they there because of you or are they there because of somebody else? And you're just a sidekick. Like you need to know all of that. You need to know to understand how they will perceive you because that will help you to take them because, and, and I'm going to tell you why this is important. What I've learned also from being um, like for some time of my career, I was doing warm ups, like warm up hostings for TV audiences, like for live TV shows. So you have a warm up guy who is, and then there is the audience and then the audience is waiting. And usually on TV, it's fairly easy because people come there to be entertained especially when you go to a show. So I, we were filming um, two shows a day and we were filming two days in a row. And I remember um, that after the first show that where I was the warm up, the producer came to me and he was like, wow, that's great. Like, it's really cool what you're doing. And it's like really nice. I said, well, thank you. But I, I didn't really do anything. Like I was just basically when they came in, I welcomed them and I was talking with them, basically having a conversation with the room and, and just, having fun with them. And I said, yeah, you know what? You won't believe how many people or how many hosts I've seen fail because they came in and it was all about them. They wanted to do their show, but people are not there to see them. People are there for themselves to have those emotions. And also they're there to experience that because with why they came there, because they know that the show why they are there is going to give them that is going to give them those emotions. And that was a big aha for me. So you need to know why is somebody there? So once again, first of all, you need to know the outcome. Second of all, you need to know where do you come from? What is the starting point? And how do you want to start? How do you get their attention? There are several ways, like for example, through a story, through a quote, through a question, through something that you can connect with them. And then thirdly, you need to tie the knots. You need to, how do I get from where I start to where I want them to go? And that's basically it. And there in between needs to be, let's call it the meat. There needs to be like the things that need to be in, in the burger, basically the thing that like stories, facts, figures, points that you can guide along the way to get them from where you start, to where you want them to go. Makes sense. Yeah, really, really great. Absolutely. Yes, I know. Terrific episode here. But have you seen our latest web training? Oh, my goodness. Pop over there right now. Or as soon as you're done listening to this episode, it's doitmarketing.com slash webinar. See you over there. Back to the good stuff. I love what you said about there are so many things that we can now do virtually that would be either impossible or highly impractical in person. One of these things is breakout rooms. And I know that as far as building community, as far as building, hey, you know, we're in the hallway, the virtual hallway experience. If we were at a live event, oh, Ronnie, all the good stuff happens in the hallway. I met Barbara and I met Steve and I met Johan and I met all these fantastic people. And we, we had lunch together. We had breakfast together. What's the digital hallway? Is it about breakout rooms? Is it about online? Like there's a Facebook group for the event or some other portal for the event, how do we build that smaller level of intimacy within a larger event, breakout rooms, online communities? What have you seen be successful? That is also a great question, David. So first of all, breakout rooms, yes, that's a very small scale. That depends on how many people are in a breakout room, but maybe it's like two, three, four, five, six people. It's normally not that many, but what works great, for example, even if, if you have a longer event, Let's say there's a lunch break, there's a dinner break or something. Keep the Zoom room open. Keep the Zoom room open. Have somebody in there from your team 
that moderates like taking questions or, or shares or like what have you learned so far? What are your breakthroughs? What do you want to talk about? Have some also in the Zoom room, depending on, of course, if your event is big enough to have several Zoom rooms, like you need to manage every Zoom room for itself. And the community that can be built in there is incredible. In the morning, when they start to come in, have the Zoom room already open. Have somebody in there saying, hey, this is your bonus time. This is the time now before we actually start the event, before we actually start the team meeting. This is the time where you can get your questions answered because you're here a bit early. Like have the doors open, doors open at this time. And then you have between 15 and 30 minutes until you actually start. And this is the time to connect. This is the time to actually to share, to also make sure that you have in the morning after these doors open, let's say you have doors open 15 minutes later, you start with a team meeting. Like just to recap what happened yesterday, also to give them a pre-frame, what is going to happen today, and also make sure that you get the opportunity to take shares. What have you learned? Like who wants to share? And then somebody who's going to raise their hand and you're going to like, who wants to share about a breakthrough, about an aha, about a learning that they had yesterday? And they are going to raise their hand. Somebody's going to raise their hand. And then like, what was it for you? And then you're going to just, it's incredible how bonding this is because they are going through the same experience. Right. And then you take this and, and you guide it and it's awesome. But like small shares, like it doesn't need to be a long thing, like two, three minutes. The next one, you, we got one more, one more, like maybe two, three, four shares max in the morning. Yeah. And then you have a break at some point, like a lunch break or something. Let's say at virtual events, you don't need to have a lunch break, like in real events for one and a half hours or something. You can make it 45 minutes, half an hour. People yeah. are at home. People can like, it's, it's very easy. And they're going to eat at some point during the event anyway. Right. And so you don't need the same time structure as, as at an in-person event. So also during that lunch break, make sure that somebody from your team is there. That not like, oh, great, everybody's out. I'm going to be out. No, you need to be somebody there taking care of the room. Also, for example, unmuting the people. Like unmuting them, like who wants to share something, having the opportunity of them like to, to share with each other, or maybe also tell them that they are also a resource to themselves. Like that not just the event here is a resource, but everybody in here has some experience that they have, are bringing to the table with. And this is a resource that you can use. Create a Facebook group, create a, create a Telegram group, create something where they can easily join and where they can keep up the communication. Like you can create a Telegram group right away. Look, this is going to be the Telegram group for the event, but maybe also have a Telegram group just for the Zoom room because they know each other and they are opening up in there. And also that's a way to contact you outside or somebody of your team outside of the event hours, for example. And it's also how you can reach them. And also, for example, if somebody, I don't know, if something happens to somebody, you can even call them over Telegram. And then afterwards, uh, you have maybe another break and you, again, then you give them again the floor and you say, you, well, any questions and any, anything you like you want to ask, anything, wh whatever it is. And at the end of the day, you're going to say, hey, hope you had a great day. And then we're going to see you tomorrow at that time. And then the same thing again. Yeah. Wow. Really, really powerful. I want to kind of zoom out 30,000 feet and then I want to let people know where to get more connection with you and your brilliance. Uh, the 30,000 foot question out of all the great gems that we've talked about today thinking about virtual events, virtual connection, virtual community, making events memorable, made making events transformational. What would you say are the one or two key takeaways that if people just remember one or two things about how to have a really amazing virtual event, what would be your advice? What do you hope people walk away from this interview with? As an event producer, don't think small when you're thinking about virtual events. Don't think virtual events is just like the little stepsister that nobody wants. When you have a real event, you're thinking about a production, you're thinking about a stage, you're thinking about music, you're thinking about screens, you're thinking about all those kind of things. Don't make it less valuable because it's virtual. You can create the same, like it's not going to be exactly the same, but you also need to create a production. You need to create something there. You also need to have some screens. You need to have some like um, directors basically who who are giving you different um, angles, different camera angles, not just one camera, like different cameras and really talk to the people and have some music there, have some entertainment there. Like think of those kind of things. Don't think of like, oh, damn, now I'm virtual and I'm just going to do a little webinar. No, you're not. Right. Exactly. I love it. Well, Ronnie Lieber, 
How do people get connected and stay connected to more of your genius website, downloads, gifts? What links can we share with people? First of all, uh, ronnielieber.com, especially when it goes slash EM for English. And also you can go there. There is my blog. Well, if you like go slash blog and, and then you go to English, there are several different, also for virtual events, but for all kinds of things when it comes to public speaking, when it comes to um, like to you being a host or maybe wanting to hire a virtual host, when does it make sense to hire a virtual host for your virtual events? Or also when it comes to video conferencing tips for you or some tips for your webinar or how to actually do a webinar, all those kind of things, you can find a blog post around it. So that's something. And also there, you can write me a message. You can write me a comment or on the contact form. You can just contact me. And of course, you can also um, follow me online on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I'm there. Awesome. Ronnie Lieber, ronnielieber.com. All of the links that Ronnie just mentioned are in the show notes directly below this episode. Ronnie, thank you. This was so incredibly valuable. It was like a dense flourless chocolate cake. I really appreciate you. Thanks for being on. Thank you, David. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.